Hey, it's Mark Podolsky at The Land Geek with favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Art of Passive Income podcast, I have an interesting guest in the sense that he's purchased distressed assets, renovated them, and stabilized them for, one of my favorite words, long-term cash flow. His portfolio includes controlling ownership of over 4,000 units in the emerging markets across Texas and the southeastern United States. My guest today is none other then Patrick Grimes from investonmainstreet.com. Patrick, how are you? I'm great. Glad to be here, Mark. I enjoyed listening to your podcast. It's fun to be on the other side of it. So Patrick, let's just get right into your, your story and your background. I mean, how did you even get into real estate? Well, I started out actually as a mechanical engineer uh, at a college bachelor's in mechanical engineering, got into machine design, automation, and robotics. And it was actually the co-founder of the company I was working for that said at one point, he goes, you know what, we have we make a lot of money, but our wealth has come from real estate. And the only regret I have is not, is not buying more real estate. It's not investing more in stocks. It's, it's not buying more real estate. Buy as much as you can as soon as you can. So <laughs> that's how I got started. I was a little bit of a rocky start because I didn't understand risk at that point. I was very ambitious and dumped everything I had into pre-development, lost it all in 9, 10, and 11, came crawling out of that, got a master's engineering in business, and then started a much lower risk uh, investment future that led to a uh, large single family, multifamily, and we diversify into natural gas and oil uh, and diversified energy portfolios now too. Okay, so walk me through your buy box. Well, so on the real estate side, we're at a two to 300 unit apartment buildings. We're looking for two, 20, about 20 to 50 years old. Ones that have been around long enough to where we can get them at a discount because they haven't been renovated in a while. Uh, they're kind of like the ugly house on the block, but all the other properties are similar in age and amenities. We just need to improve them. Uh, renovate them, make them look uh, like the nearby properties to get those rents up. And we do that in recession resilient markets, ones that have shown to bounce back quickly or actually do well in recessions like Southeastern states that are landlord friendly and tax advantage places that jobs and income and people are moving to. Yeah, the Southeast, I've, I've talked to a lot of multifamily guys, they're all in the Southeast. What is, <laughs> what is it about the Southeast? Well, so I'm actually, you know, right behind me, I have a sunny Southern California, Orange County Lake, and it's beautiful and the weather's great, but it is hostile to business owners. Uh, it's hostile to landlords. So if you're going to take your investments seriously, uh, then you would start thinking a little bit like a lot of the companies that are moving out of places like California, uh, Seattle, New York, and landing in places like uh, Texas, right? Uh, Northern Southern Carolinas, Georgia, because those are legislative friendly. They're, especially if you're doing a real estate business, you want to find a government that'll let you evict people that aren't paying, that'll let you raise rents that doesn't have rent control after you've renovated and made it a better quality place. And places that where people are moving, because ultimately it's the employers that are paying you. So you need to have great employers. You need to have growing employers, which draws in your tenants, right? And so it's, it's just a matter of analysis. My engineering background and having lost it all once puts me deep into the economics. And I've talked before on economics and on stages and investing strategies. And the reality is every business owner, every, every person has an investment business, whether they like it or not. And the sooner you start treating your investment portfolio like that, uh, the better off you're going to be. Say more about that. Everyone has an investment business, whether they like it or not. Yeah. Why? Well, so the funny thing is, I work with mostly accredited investors, like uh, you know, uh, individuals that can drop a hundred thousand in deals because we raise too much. We raise you know, eight million to two hundred million to kind of do the smaller ten, twenty, thirty k investments. Most of those are they're entrepreneurs, they're chief executive officers, doctors, lawyers, high income earners that spend their whole lives becoming the expert in this little niche, right? And then they'll have all these other people that they're paying in their lives to fix their home or you know, to fix their cars, all these other experts that they rely on and they, they have them fix up. When it comes to their investment portfolio, oftentimes they're like, no, I wanna keep control. 
I want to go do it myself. I want to go find my own rental property. Like I did, I want to go find some land and build on it. And, and it's nearby me where it's not landlord friendly. And, you know, the reality is if you take the, uh, your investment, your personal investment portfolio, and you look at it as another department of your company, and now you're going to hire somebody because you're like, you think, well, I'm not, I'm not the expert in this piece of the company. I'm not the expert, just like in finance, right? Or it, w- you're not the expert in the investment side of your own personal life. And you would hire somebody to come and manage that for you because you're too busy doing everything else. The reality is people have that because they're working at this hard job to produce all this income, but they don't treat that income the same way that they would if that income was going back into the business, right? Right where they would look at immediate returns, doing what's the best for the bottom line. They have this sense of like control and, and, and not wanting to put other people in charge and not wanting to partner up. Oftentimes that gets you in trouble like it did me back in 2008 and nine. No, it's interesting that you say that. It's an emotional issue with money. Everyone has their own ideas about it. Mm-hmm. But from a business perspective, especially when you're talking about accredited investors, high net worth individuals, they understand the concept of scaling much more intimately than say someone who might not be at that high net worth level yet. And that idea that Dan Sullivan and Ben Hardy have that book, Who Not How. Mm -hmm. And so that really resonates with me. It makes a lot of sense to have the best person invest as as a separate business Mm -hmm. running that business for you. And if just mm-hmm. like if you would have a marketing person, they're thinking all day long about marketing and offers. You'd have a your bookkeepers thinking all day long about uh, you know how to balance the books. Your your CPA is thinking all day long. Well, if you have a good CPA, how to, how right. to you know mitigate your taxes? You mm-hmm. want somebody who's thinking all day long about where's the best place to put my money to get tax advantages and cash flow. So. That leads me to uh, the the point of when you're looking at, say, a cash flowing property, how how do you think about it in the sense of it's got, let's say, right now it's at a five cap. A lot of people th- don't even look at cap rates. How do you think about <clears throat> it as far as you know, valuing it as a, a good deal or not? Well, first, let me just tag team what you were saying before. What you're saying before is right on. And I've got articles and forms that I wrote on that kind of single do it yourself versus large scaled, large syndications. And, and I, if you Patrick Grimes Forbes, you can read along those lines of exactly that conversation. I talked to thousands of investors. They all have that same challenge you were talking about. Um, so for me, coming out of 2008, nine, having bought a money hole, essentially paid into it, hoping that I was going to get to the other side of this pre-development, hoping I was going to get an asset and that somebody would want to buy or rent this asset, not having cash flowed. Every single deal in the multifamily, large apartment communities we we buy now, they will, there's a line in there saying conservative financing and conservative analysis and projections. And it says underwritten with an eye towards what happened in you know, 9, 10, and 11 as opposed to what happened in, you know, essentially the last five years, right? Last 10 years even. And, um, and I, I believe that if it can't, if it can't write out a recession, then you shouldn't be doing the deal, which means that we look very much at, first of all, the location, we said cap rates. First, we look at the location. Uh, if it's a recession resilient location, then we want to cash flow strong enough that we have a break even occupancy that allows us to write out where vacancies have dropped, right? When, when, you, still- when you say recession resilient, mm-hmm. are you defining that as an area that's more blue collar? Not necessarily. I, you know, Detroit was a blue collar and that wasn't recession resilient. And so the it's, it's not like a old school Detroit or a mining town. You're looking at employment because again, it's the employers which pay your rents in real estate, right? Right. Um, through the residents. And so it's the stability of the paycheck givers that will be the stability of your resident base. That's my firm belief. And I talk about this on stages. So if you look at which ones survived better through you know, 2008, 9, and 10, it was the ones that had a diverse employment base, but specific verticals that it is split up in essentially that have built in insulation for market volatility. Examples of those are 
education, right? People are always getting educated. Healthcare, it's, healthcare always is needed, right? Uh, logistics, those are hard to move around, like ports. Those kinds of things are hard to fleet around to, to other locations. High tech is not there. In fact, high tech's one of the reasons why Phoenix busted. It's one of the reasons why San Jose busted just in this last one, because it can be moved very easily. A percentage of manufacturing, um, also in finance. Finance also tends to be a very strong recession resilient market. So there's lots of these kind of pillars that have built an in insulation for market volatility. You want to find a balance of those with things that indicate it's a desirable place. Like you're going to have retail trade and hospitality as a healthy 10, 15% of an economy, but not like a 40 plus percent, like a Las Vegas, right? And what happens is when you kind of overlay those economic indicators over different areas, and then you add to it the landlord-friendly, legislative-friendly that allows you to evict when you need to, raise rents when you need to, you know, there's only a handful of places left. Uh, and that's very narrowly, you know, where we will focus on the real estate investments. Okay. And I apologize for cutting you off with recession resilient. I love the way you answered that question, but go on with your, your valuation. What was the valuation again? So we were talking about, you're looking at recession resilient markets. We didn't get to cap rates yet, but how else you, you're looking at what you would define as a deal? Oh yeah. So it was the break-even occupancy is where we're occupancy. looking at, right? Because okay. it, Essentially, our business is really geared around finding great investment deals. Where do those come from? Well, those tend to not be ones that are on the market. Those tend to be when they're off market. Uh, why is that? Well, because somebody's distressed. They don't have residents that are paying. Maybe they had a financial disaster like a COVID or an environmental disaster like a hurricane or a tornado, or they had a fire, right? Or a flood or something. And then so or a compounding sense of those or they didn't get the right debt. Maybe they're debt distressed and their interest rate wasn't capped or fixed. And now it's raising and it consumed all their cash flow or a combination of there. And then they didn't have the reserves to ride it out. And so I've listed about seven things there. And if you unpack those in order to make sure that we don't become the distressed deal of tomorrow, the distressed operator that we're constantly buying deals from, we need to make sure we put enough down in our properties so that our cash flow is high. And you said, you know, cap rates, we got to make sure that we're buying at an income basis and we put enough down so that we can cash flow to the point where if vacancies drop to where they have in prior recessions, that break even occupancy, that, that allowable vacancy is well below that point. But you also have to compound the fact that, well, we still have to cash flow if we have variable interest rates, the cash flow, even if the interest rate goes to our cap and raises up, it's so got to factor that in too. And then what happens if we have all of that happen and then we have a fire? The, the building we're picking up in Atlanta right now, the operator had a 14% bad debt during COVID, couldn't renovate the unit, so he couldn't raise the rents because he ran out of money. And then a building burned down. And so it was an interest rate issue. It was all those issues compounded. So as long as you get a, put enough down, get an interest rate cap that allows you to cash flow, get insurance that allows you to rebuild buildings or and cover your vacancy loss, but then you have to write it out. So you have to have reserves in the bank. The reserves in the bank are usually six to eight months in reserves that we'll store up in an account. And that allows us to, to write it out and preserve our investors capital and not have to be a fire sale. So you kind of compound all of that. And then you say at the end of all that, you couldn't possibly make a return. Well, we do it all the time not double and triple your money. I was listening to one of your podcasts and somebody was saying, well, you can get your capital back in 12 months. Well, it may take us three years. It may take us three years to get your capital back, but we have capital preservation, recession resilience. We're going we're gonna to make sure that you're cash flowing and appreciating through markets. And it's tax shielded cash flow. Inflation has cash flow. It's the tortoise, not the hare. But I'm, I'm, I'm a believer that it's better to invest where you know you're not going to lose it all and get a reasonable return. And I'm, I'm willing to find the right investors. And we've raised 50, over 50 million just in the last you know, handful, a couple, few hundred million in, in real estate that we bought. We have a 500 million portfolio of multifamily now. They're out there. Those are the investors that are long-term uh, focused, legacy wealth builders. And those are the best partners for us. 
I love it. It's so funny because multifamily operators are always jealous of me and my returns and the simplicity. And I'm always jealous of multifamily operators because you don't pay taxes. So I think there is a place where there's a nice blend in everyone's investment portfolio where you get the ridiculous returns where you would have land and make a cash flow. But also, like you said, you're more conservative. You're the tortoise, you're not the hare, but you're also getting those great tax advantages with the depreciation, uh, hopefully, which is offsetting because look, land lasts forever. So you, you, you don't get those tax advantages at all. Well, um, that, that might lead into the energy stuff if you don't mind me piggybacking. Yeah, let's go into energy. Well, so the tax advantages in energy are uh, just like it's an essential need, right? You got to house, feed, and energize America. And the reason why, one of the major reasons why we're in the energy is because it's a completely non correlated asset. You have the stock market going crazy, big roller coaster, and you have real estate, which has its much more slower swings up and down. And we're in a correction right now. But then a completely non, non correlated asset to either of those is, is diversified energy funds where we're doing oil and gas drilling. And I think it's interesting what you say because we, we do, in fact, we don't buy land, but we buy leases. <laughs> We, we lease land. That's the asset. We're not buying a building and we're not buying the land, but there are landowners, but we pay those a percentage of the profits. Instead of renovating units, we, we drill wells. Uh, instead of buying proven existing buildings, we buy leases with known reserves. And the tax advantages on that end, well, first of all, the cash flow is not, it's there and actually growing at this point when real estate's waning. But the tax advantages on that side are what's potentially even more attractive because usually about 75% of your investment comes off your ordinary income. Like for the lawyers and entrepreneurs who invest hundred grand, like 75 off of your taxes. It's incredible. And so that IRS alignment with the essential needs investing and investing where they want you to go is incredible. In addition to that diversification play. But I think it's kind of funny because it's a little bit, I could be leasing land from you <laughs> somewhere out there and you could be collecting the lease, uh, the lease royalties on that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm I'm glad you you brought that up. And I assume that those funds again are accredited investors only. So here's the here's the rub is the accredited investor uh by by filing in a way that uh, limits accredited investors allows me to talk about this right now. If I if I'm talking about hey, these are our investments and these are our deals and we have offerings available, then, then I could not be bringing in non-accredited investors. So it's kind of like a chicken before the egg. In order to increase and make aware the, 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 the knowledge, the increase of financial IQ of America that these alternative investments exist, somebody like me is going to come out and say, hey, look, we'll file in a way such that we can openly talk about it. It's going to limit us to accredited investors. You got 200,000 in income, 300,000 combined with your spouse or a million in net worth, not including your personal residence. But if you're not one of those and you can't invest 100,000, you can still reach out. I, I have partners of mine that bring in what are friends and family type pre-existing relationships. So you got to meet them and wait for the next deal. But they do investments just like this for non-accredited investors. The disadvantages, they're so hard to find because they can't talk about it. They can't openly market it. They can't do what I'm doing right now. So I'm, I'm here to help out uh, whomever but, uh, but of course, you know, we're raising 10 to 200 million uh, on our funds. And so we do that 100,000 a piece uh, plus with accredited investors. But if you're not there, that's okay. I can help you. <laughs> you know, I, that's why I'm writing for Forbes. I'm teaching a lot, all kinds of things. I'm talking on stage to all kinds of people. And I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. I think that's, that's great and, and really so generous of you. So my last question before we get to the tip of the week is mm -hmm. if I'm evaluating three or four different multifamily operators, what's a couple questions I'd want to ask to be able to differentiate them? Yeah, I was just, I was speaking on a stage in economics in Chicago recently, and it was, there was a panel of us talking about doing deals today and somebody asked that question and uh, when I was answering, I took a step back real quick because I looked at the other panelists. And what I realized is that all the other panelists that were brave enough to talk about how to do deals in today's economy and the, were the panelists that weren't in trouble in today's economy. And all of us had one thing in common. We had all lost a lot of money in 2009 and 10. <laughs> and we had just 
we had just tanked it and bombed. And I think that that humbling and that resetting, um, understanding how the the markets shift, how the demand shifts, and how the economic models break down, and how the how the debts behave, the debt markets behave when things start to crumble, it fortifies your risk aversion to continue forth in a more measurable way. And so I think that that's a definite question: is what is it had? Did you fail? And if not, then when? And how did you do it? And and I think I always ask about were you were you around in prior downturns and what happened? What's that story? And then I ask about what the stress testing is. The stress testing or how can you survive a downtown downturn like that if we have another one? Again, I'm a capital preservation guy, both in my energy diversified energy funds as well as multifamily. I want to know how would this survive in a collapse? How do we ride it out? Do you have reserves? Do you have replacement cost insurance? Do you have a low enough break-even occupancy? What were the vacancies in prior recessions in this market for this kind of asset class? Do they even know the answers? Oftentimes when I ask these questions, they don't even understand the question. They're like, can you clarify? Specifically, I'm like, you don't, if they don't know, then they don't know. <laughs> you know if you know, but you don't know if you don't know. And it's really interesting to see all that. But I, it just comes from, you know, being a little bit of a burn victim. I've been through the downturn, right? I've been through it. And that's that's where I start typically. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been investing in land since 2000 and have gone through the the same type of cycle. And I'm actually looking forward to the downturn now because we're going to get better deals. But for someone who's never been through it, they don't have the same type of humility that is hard earned and hard won. And so, that is, that's not just real estate. You know, when COVID happened, it allowed us to buy a bunch of discounted deals in oil and gas. And we've got some incredible offerings because of that. And so in each market, you have those people that are, that are looking for the right timing, more conservative. And it's just whether or not you got the right operator to be able to be patient enough to wait it out and to place those investments at the right time. Well, Patrick Rimes, your mentorship has been invaluable, but now we're at that point where I'm going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable for the Art of Passive Income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Well, with so much going on, uh, what has been really powerful for us is the book, The One Thing by Gary Keller. I That, that book, the time blocking and that 80-20, it just, it totally shifted my approach and allowed me to kind of get some clarity and peace. Aside from my morning runs around the lake behind me with my puppy in the morning <laughs> when I was listening, when I listened to your podcast. But aside from that, uh, uh, listening to that book and um, uh, implementing those techniques have just been a game changer for not only me, but I have my employees listening to it now. And we shared each other's calendars to see the time blocking that we're doing. And we talk about, hey, of our, we just had a big company meeting. It was like two hours. And at the end, we reviewed what our one things were and got an alignment on those. I think this is incredible. It's a great book and one that we always recommend. It's, I think it's the kind of book you should just read at least once a year, mm -hmm. if not once a quarter. So great recommendation. My tip of the week is learn more about Patrick Grimes and go to investonmainstreet.com, investonmainstreet.com. He's got a podcast, he's got books, he's got resources, look at the portfolio, look at the team, check it out, investonmainstreet.com. Patrick Grimes, are we good? Would you want me to offer one of my books to your listeners? Fantastic, absolutely, it's so generous. Well, so uh, persistence, pivots, and game changers, turning challenges and opportunities. This was the first time I wrote out my whole story. I did a whole chapter in this. Some really cool guys, Phil Collins, the lead guitarist of Def Leppard, uh, NFL, NBA, entrepreneurs, this incredible people that we did this. And it talks about the ebbs and flows, the pivots, and the, the persistence required to make it. Um, and my battle between the high tech world and real estate and private equity and energy and how I made it through. I, I love this. It was such a fun project. I, we, we, I'm happy to offer a, a free signed copy to your listeners just to add value to their journey. They go to investonmainstreet.com slash book. That's invest on and then main and then street all spelled out.com slash book. 
Uh, you can set up a meeting with me if you'd like, but it's not required. And uh, the promo code, just put in there, make sure that we know who you are, the art of passive income. And we'd love to contribute to your journey. Fantastic. We'll put that in the show notes and have a link to that. That is so generous. I want to remind listeners that we are sponsored by Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally change your life. Start building that passive income quickly, safely, and efficiently with Scott Todd, Azure Sherpa, who's done it thousands of times. Create that passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents. Learn more. Go to landgeek.com forward slash training, thelandgeek.com forward slash training. I know what you're thinking, well, how much is all of this training going to cost me? It ain't going to cost you nothing. Guaranteed, you're going to make it back 180 days or less. Just show us your work, thelandgeek.com forward slash training. And look, if you're enjoying the podcast, if you're getting value, the best favor you can do is if you just follow, rate, review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review, support at thelandgeek.com. You get a signed book from me of Dirt Rich. So Patrick Grimes, are we good? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks again. Let freedom ring. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.